at Thyatira. Thyatira, to the church at Thyatira. We looked at the church at Pergamum last week, and the church at Pergamum was, uh, in essence, kind of dipping their toes. Uh, uh, some of them had compromised with the world, and we talked about what it means to be separate from the world and to not walk in compromise. And there were some, the majority of the church in Pergamum was walking as they should walk, but there were some, as it says in there, that had embraced ungodliness and idolatry. And so that's what we looked at last week. But this week, this is not the picture. This week it is a different picture. It's not the minority of the church that is dipping their toes in. It is the majority of the church that is not just dipping their toes in immorality and sin, but it is headlong into it. It's kind of like this. I, I went on a, a trip to Wisconsin a few weeks back. I got invited to preach uh, at a good friend of mine, a, pa a pastor named Philip Thompson, who is going to eventually come here to preach for us here, here on a Sunday. And, I, and he hosts an annual missions conference. So I've been to his missions conference. Uh, this is my third year to go, uh, first year to speak at it. And there's a hotel he puts us up at. And there's a hot tub there. And there's some friends of mine, and we, we do what we call tub time and these are these middle-aged pastors going to get into the hot tub. <laughs> and uh, so I just have to say that this hot tub, I've been in a few hot tubs. This hot tub is the hottest hot tub I have ever been in in my life. I remember the first time three years ago, I, I, I went to just get in. And I went, oh, no, you cannot just get in. You got to dip your toes and then you got you to gotta get your shins in and then up to your knees, up to your thighs. And you slowly get in. Right? You ever, you've experienced that, whether you've run the water to your bath a little bit too hot, takes you a little while to get in. This is kind of a picture of what happened to Thyatira. This is what happens in our lives. Generally speaking, we don't compromise a whole lot all at once. We just get our toes in. We kind of dabble our toes in. And next thing you know, we're not just toe deep. We're, we're ankle deep in compromise. And then we're knee deep. And then next thing you know, we're fully embraced. And what was hot before, what was shocking before doesn't shock anymore. Because we're just in it, we're, we've grown accustomed to compromise and to, and to sin. What one generation would have not tolerated in the church, now there's a whole generation that doesn't just tolerate certain things, they embrace certain sins. What we are willing to tolerate now, the next generation after us will not just tolerate it, they will embrace it. You guys follow what I'm trying to say here? This is the downward spiral. It's like a downward spiral. This is what sin does and compromise does. And, and we would be na naive to think that that doesn't take place within churches and within Christians' lives. And this is what we see. This is what we see in these letters. It's a downward progression, a downward spiral. And, and Sardis next week, it's a, it's a similar picture. And then Philadelphia gives us a breath of fresh air, a church with no rebuke from our Lord. So come in a couple weeks, it's going to be no rebuke. But then the last week, the last week, the Lord says, I'd rather you be hot or cold, but you're lukewarm. And you know what happens after that, right? That's where we're going to end. But this is the downward progression that we see. And Thyatira receives a shocking letter. I mean, this is unbelievable. This is some of the strongest language of rebuke that we have seen up to this point. It's so shocking. And so there's so many ways in which I thought about how I, I could approach this. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to read the section of this letter. And I just want you to feel the weight of the words. And then I'm going to explain some details of this letter, and then I'm going to ask a question. There's many questions that might come up when you read a letter like this from Jesus. Jesus writes this letter to the church at Thyatira. So there's questions that would come up, but I have one question that we're going to ask. We're going to unpack that question. But let's read this shocking letter to a church that is, is, is neck deep in compromise. Revelation 2, it says this. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. Sounds good. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. 
I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. Wow. Would someone else like to come preach this this morning? <laughs> I was like, Lord, <laughs> pass the baton. <laughs> but, but just a little, little sidebar here just to explain that this is why we go verse by verse because I probably wouldn't choose to pick Thyatira. Let's just, let's just do Ephesus. Let's just do Smyrna and Philadelphia. No, we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to study it because this is God's word and it is good for us. Even the hard stuff. Thyatira, of, of all the cities, was the smallest city that we studied. Smallest of the seven cities. And they were known for their, what we call, and I've talked about this the last couple of weeks, they were known for their trade guilds, right, which would be like trade unions. And, and a part of the problem with the early church during, in these cities in, 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 uh, in Asia here, in Bible times, was that these trade unions, these were the only ways in which you would work. And so if you as a Christian would not pledge allegiance to the emperor as Lord and declare him as Lord, then you would be excluded from these trade unions and so then great persecution would come into your life, not only physically because you couldn't provide for your family, but then even, even physically, your physical life was in danger. And so this is what Thyatira, uh, th this is how their commerce, how their com commerce worked. But one of the things, one of the areas that they were known for in Thyatira was their work in fabrics and, and in dyes, dyeing of fabric. And one of the colors that they were famous for was the color purple. Do you remember, if you, study, if you study in the book of Acts, do you remember a woman named Lydia? Lydia was a seller of purple who was from Thyatira. And the gospel comes to her through the Apostle Paul's missionary journeys. And Lydia gets saved. And it says in the book of Acts that Lydia gets saved and all of her household gets saved. So we don't know specifically how the church got started in Thyatira, but, but we can say that for sure that Lydia was a part of that. So Lydia got born again, her whole household gets born again, and the gospel is birthed in this region, and it begins to grow, right? But similar emperor worship, similar pagan idolatry as in other cities, similar persecution for Christians, and this is kind of a little bit of a background to Thyatira. Now, let's look at some of these details of the introduction of this letter and this rebuke that the Lord gives, and then we'll get to the question that we're going to ask. So, notice in the introduction, Jesus introduces himself, the Lord of the church, which is Christ, introduces himself in different ways. In this letter, he says that he is the Son of God. He's the Son of God. He doesn't say, he didn't, he, he didn't say I'm the Son of Man who has come, right, to die and to, to die on the cross and to redeem you from your sins, he says, no, I am the son of God with eyes like flaming fire and feet like burnished bronze. He's saying the God of the universe is talking to you right now. And this picture of eyes like fire is the fire, the purifying fire of the holiness of God is gazing into the church at Thyatira. And feed like burnished bronze, and we see later in Revelation, and we've talked about this over the last few weeks, this picture is a picture of judgment. Bronze feet coming and, and walking out, stamping out judgment, not only in the world, but also as you see here, he's coming and saying, I'm going to bring judgment unless you repent. So he begins this letter with a, with a picture of the reality that Christ is coming to bring judgment to his church. That's drawing for us as Christians is when we think of judgment, we don't think of the church, do we? We think of the, those really bad sinners in the world. But Christ judges, brings judgment, brings truth, brings correction into his church because he wants purity for his church so that we can be willing and able vessels to reach into the world so that they can escape eternal judgment, right? Right? And so no, notice, so he comes and he gives this picture of judgment. This is who he is. He's wanting them to know I'm coming with eyes of fire and feet of, with, as burnished bronze. But then he says this. He says there's love, there's faith, there's service, there's endurance. And, and that is commended. He's saying it's not all bad. There's some. There's a minority. There's some that are in here that 
I see your faith. I see your service. I see your endurance. And I'm commending that in your life. But then he quickly turns and he gets to this section. And he says this. He says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Did anybody name their daughter Jezebel? Do you know why people don't name their daughter Jezebel? Because of Jezebel from 1 Kings 18. That's why you don't name your daughter Jezebel. And so he says, you're tolerating this woman Jezebel. And I want you to know what I believe. I don't believe this woman is actually named Jezebel because people didn't name their daughters Jezebel. I believe it was the spirit that Jezebel carried with her. And this is a woman, and it clearly is a woman that had, came into, had come into the church at Thyatira, and she called herself a prophetess. She began to teach and encourage people to practice sexual immorality and idolatry. And so he's saying, you are tolerating that woman, Jezebel. Now, now sometimes when we talk about Jezebel, we want to talk about what people call the Jezebel spirit. And so... What is the Jezebel spirit? Because I know that some of you maybe want to know that. What is is the Jezebel spirit? Well, this woman that Jesus, the Lord of the church, is confronting through this letter, she walked in what would be called the Jezebel spirit. Now, I just want to say that women get thrown under under the bus with this, you ladies. Because sometimes we we, we think men can't walk in the spirit of Jezebel, so it's only these ladies. and, 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 And there's one word that comes to mind when we think of the Jezebel spirit and we look at women and we say, you're just a controlling woman. So you got a Jezebel spirit. And I'm here to tell you, that is not true. That's not what the Jezebel spirit is. So I just want to kind of burst that bubble for you. So when you hear somebody say, oh, that's just a controlling woman. She's got the spirit of Jezebel. It's nowhere in the Bible, by the way. Men can be just as controlling as women. That's just a whole other subject. What's the Jezebel spirit? Well, it's there in the text. And it's also there in 1 Kings 18. What did the literal Jezebel do in 1 Kings 18? She was an idolatrous. She was a pagan. She married King Ahab, who was the king of Israel, and she set up idolatry into the nation of Israel. And then she encouraged sexual immorality. So if we were to define what the spirit of Jezebel is, if someone has a Jezebel spirit, it would be somebody who encourages others to practice sexual immorality and to walk in idolatry. That's the Jezebel spirit. So so I want to help you to define what that is. That's what it really is. And this is what the Lord is saying, that there's a woman that's coming to the church and she's encouraging the church to embrace sin. She's encouraging the church and, and she's using twisted things. She's twisting truth. How much, does, how much would it take to get a whole church, not just the minority and a few like in Pergamum, but an entire church to go the direction of not just tolerating sin, but embracing sin to the point that the Lord comes and says, I'm going to bring judgment to you. She was, she was quick. She was good with her words. And false teachers and false teaching is subtle, but sometimes Sometimes people can be deceived so easily by it, and it sounds so good, it sounds so palatable, and it makes sense that God would be okay if I dabble a little bit in this other type of activity and lifestyle. It's a false teaching, and this is what is going on. Notice the Lord says this. He says, I have given her time to repent, but she refuses. So notice the hardness of this woman's heart. The Lord says, I have offered her time. Repent, repent. So some way, the Lord has confronted this woman, but she has not responded. And so he says, I will throw her onto a sickbed, which means she's going to die. You know, sometimes when the Lord judges, sometimes when the Lord judges even this side of eternity, that it can be death, that God can judge. He can give people time to repent, and they, they refuse, and he can judge them, and they can die. This is what the text is saying here. And notice what it says next. Her children... Those who, those who follow her teaching. So it's not literally her physical children. This would be her children that are following her teaching. He says, I am calling them to repentance or else I will judge them as well. He says, I will kill them as well. Wow. That's some sobering stuff. We don't like to think about these things. These are not the things that, that, that we advertise. Hey, we're preaching on the spirit of Jezebel this morning and how God can judge you. We don't really talk about that very often, but this is a picture. This is how far this church has gone. And notice what he ends with here. He says, he says, I'm doing this so that all the churches will know that I am the Lord who searches mind and heart. And it says, all the churches will fear the Lord. 
Unless you think this is just some isolated case. There's two cases in the New Testament. Do you remember the book of Acts, Ananias and Sapphira? What happened? They lied to the Holy Spirit and their bodies got carried out of the church. They died. In, first, in, in Corinthians, Paul addresses the church at Corinth and he says, some of you are getting sick and you are dying because you're taking the cup of the Lord's Supper and you're doing it mixed with sin. Some of you are getting sick and weak and dying. Wow. It's a biblical reality. It's not one we talk about often, but it is biblical truth. And this is a shocking letter, and it raises some questions for us. And this is the question that kept coming over in my mind over and over again as I was reading this and thinking, Lord, how do I approach this? How, how, do, I, how do we think about this, about a church that's not just a few people dipping their toes in compromise, but you've got a whole church that is headlong into compromise? How does that happen? So the question that I came up with, and it should be on your handout here, it's, here's the question that we'll try to answer. Why do Christians or churches tolerate sin? Why do Christians or churches tolerate sin? Or you could say, why do Christians or churches embrace sin? Not just tolerate, but like this church, embrace sin. Why does that happen? So I have three answers that I believe will help us to wrap our mind around why that happens and how that can happen. The first answer I believe is this. Why do Christians or churches tolerate sin? Number one, because leaders have failed in their responsibility. Because leaders fail in their responsibility. As leaders go, so go the, so go the people. And this doesn't just play out in the church, this plays out in the home. Parents, if you want your kids to walk in a life that is pleasing to the Lord, you must be the one as a leader that sets the trajectory for your home. There's no guarantee your kids will follow in the direction that you go, but I know for sure that if you walk in compromise and sin in your life, it is much more likely that your kids will follow that pattern as well. And the opposite of that is true as well. If you walk in righteousness and holiness and purity before the Lord and you pursue him, it's much more likely your kids will follow. As leaders go, so go the people in the family, on the job, in your marriage, but also in the church. God always holds leaders responsible for the care of the people that he's entrusted to them. And so when we're thinking about the context of a church, who has God entrusted people to in the church? He's entrusted them to shepherds, to pastors, for the protection and the feeding of the flock of God. And you look back in the history of the nation of Israel, the, 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 the history of the nation of Israel was that God's people were led by leaders who would continually compromise, like King Ahab. He married a pagan woman. He allowed Jezebel to come in and to bring idolatry into the kingdom, to set up idolatry and false worship into the kingdom. He allowed that to happen. He didn't lead the nation. He led, he led the nation by embracing an idolatrous woman. He led the nation into sin. And he allowed the worship of, ba of, of Baal, of of, of, of Baal to take place. As leaders go, so goes the nation. The prophet Jeremiah calls the nation back to the Lord. Listen to this, Jeremiah 3.15. He calls them back over and over again, and then he tells them this. He says, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. So the prophet Jeremiah is calling out to the leaders, and he's telling them, repent and return. Lead the people as I've called you. And he tells the people, I'm going to raise up shepherds who will feed you. The prophet Ezekiel, look at, look at this, Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel, the leaders of my people. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus says the Lord God, ah, oh, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourself with, with, with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. It falls on leaders to lead the people that God's entrusted to them. And specifically in this context, as a church, there was a failure with the leaders in this church. I don't even need to have it spelled out for us in the text. We know that there was a failure. They were not addressing this false prophetess that had come in. And there would have no doubt been other false teachings that were in there. And the leaders had failed. They had not confronted and addressed the false teaching. And now the people were deceived and believing things that weren't true. 
It falls on the pastors of the church to feed and protect God's people. When pastors fail in this responsibility, people are left vulnerable to destructive and damning doctrines. You remember I read a few weeks back in Acts chapter 20, the call that Paul gave to the Ephesian elders when we studied the letter to the church in Ephesus. Listen to this. This is to pastors. Pay careful attention to yourself. That means pastors, walk holy before the Lord. Pay careful attention to your life. You cannot lead people as a pastor unless you are following Christ first. Pay careful attention to yourselves, but also to all of the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in, not sparing the flock like this woman Jezebel. Fierce wolves will come in and from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. This is what is happening in the church in Thyatira. Disciples are being drawn after false teaching and false prophets. And they're embracing sin. And they're embracing what some would call the deep things of Satan, as we'll see later in this text in Revelation. And the leaders were not protecting the sheep. And I want to tell you, this responsibility is what drives my motivation. It's what drives me personally. This is what drives me because Acts 20 tells me something so powerful. It says that you belong to Christ. You're his. You're not mine. This is not my church and you're not my people. You are his people. And notice what the text there says in, Ephesians, in Acts 20. It says that he obtained you with his blood. That cup of juice that we drank that represents the blood of Christ. The blood that he shed, he shed for you. And if you place your faith in him, that means he redeemed you, which means that he purchased you back from slavery to sin, which means that if you've been purchased by Christ, you belong to him. So here's what Christ has told me. He says, Ben, when I, when, when, when I on, on, on March 4th, 2018, when I stood on this stage and Pastor Renee laid his hands on me and he gave me that sword and he gave me that prayer shawl and he laid his hands on me and he prayed over me and I, I received the responsibility. On that day, the Lord said, Ben, here are my sheep. Take care of them. Here are my sheep. Here are some blood-bought, redeemed sheep of my pasture. Watch them for me until I return. That's the call of a pastor. All those here that are, are pastors are called to be a pastor. This is the responsibility God has given us. And this is the failure that had happened in the church of Thyatira. The leaders, the pastor, has, had, had failed to protect the sheep. And the Lord tells the pastors, watch them until I return. Protect them from lies. Feed them my word. Love them and care for them as your own. I love my kids. I love your kids, but I love my kids much more than I love your kids because <laughs> they're my kids, right? And if I gave you my kids and I said, would you protect them and watch over them? I'm expecting you to love them and protect them as much as I would love and protect them. And if you don't, I'm going to judge you, <laughs> right? It's the same thing with the church and the people of God. It's the same thing. So this is why, this, is res this responsibility, when I think about this, it reminds me that this responsibility is too great for me to do it on my own. I cannot bear this responsibility on my own. I need other pastors. I need other men that would come alongside of me and work with me to shepherd you, to feed you, to protect you, to love you, to care for you. So this is what I want to say here. I want to give a little sidebar here of just a reminder of what we're doing and who we are as a church. We do have multiple pastors that are on staff, full-time pastors. And we pray for you every day and we shepherd you and we go to lunch uh, with you and we, we help you hopefully in your marriage when we do counseling and, and, and we pray for you in staff meetings and we are full-time. This is our vocation. This is what we do. But for the first time in our church, We've been moving towards, and I mentioned this several months back, we've been moving towards a, a multiplicity of elders outside of what we already have to have lay elders. Those, those who would be full-time businessmen, uh, full -time, they, they have careers outside of the church, but they feel the call to be a shepherd, to be an elder. Elder, shepherd is the same term. 
And so I've been working with these men for the last, it's going to be going on in January, we we'll make 14 months. I've been meeting with them at least once a month. And we have an ongoing chat and a text group that we chat and I text and I encourage, we pray for each other. And, and I've been working with them to hear my heart and to understand what the responsibility is. And so the next few weeks, next month, potentially, next few weeks into January, we're going to present these, there's seven men, started with about 20 of them. And not all of them felt called, not all of them felt like that's what God had for them. And, and so it wasn't maybe the, 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 the season God had for them. But these seven men are going to make it through, Lord willing, and I'm going to present them to you on a Sunday morning. And I'll come up here, I'm going to present them to you and say, these brothers are elder candidates. And I'm going to give you two weeks from that Sunday to the next two Sundays to give me any reason why these men could not, should not be elders. You can call me, text me, email me, and say, I don't know about that guy. And then we'll, we'll vet it out, and we'll go through that process. I don't believe that will happen with any of these seven men. And then after that process, we're going to, on a Sunday morning, we're going to get the other pastors that are on staff to come up. We're going to lay hands on these men. We're going to ordain them, and we're going to begin to function, and they'll be, begin to function as recognized elders and pastors, lay elders within the life of this church. Amen? I'm excited. I'm going to clap for that because I'm excited about that. This model is Moses and Jethro. Do you remember Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses? Moses was staying up all night long, meeting the needs of the people, hearing all kinds of things from the people, all their problems. And Jethro, the father-in-law said, Moses, this thing that you're doing is not wise. Pick out for yourself some men that love the Lord, that are unstained from the world, that meet the qualifications, set them apart and set them over this group and over that group and have them manage the needs and anything that is greater that they can't manage, they can bring it to you. So this is the model. It's a multiplicity of elders. And here's, here is the point. Multiple shepherds equals multiplied shepherding impact. So that's what we're going to do. So that we can help you not be deceived by the lies of the world. So we can care for you and love you and shepherd you. So back to the question, why do Christians and churches tolerate sin? I believe it starts with leaders who fail in their responsibility to protect the church from lies and who fail in acknowledging and addressing the temptations and sins that easily entrap us as believers. Should not shepherds feed the sheep? Amen? What's the second reason I believe that, that, that Christians and churches tolerate sin? The second reason would be this. Because many Christians have a deficient understanding of who God is. Many Christians have a deficient understanding of who God is. You know what a deficiency is? Anybody have an iron deficiency here today? What would an iron deficiency be called? Anemia, right? Or you are anemic if you lack iron. Well, here's a definition that I got off the internet for what that would be. It says, without enough iron, your body cannot produce enough of a substance in red blood cells red blood cells that enables them to carry oxygen. As a result, iron deficiency or, or anemia may leave you tired and short of breath, right? A deficiency. I believe that the reason Christians tolerate sin, which ultimately would be why churches would tolerate sin, is because they have a deficient understanding of who God is is in his character and his nature. And this ultimately is directly connected to the previous point about leaders. That is our job as leaders to make sure you understand who God is so you're not deficient in your understanding of all that God is, 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 all that God is in his character and his nature. Many believers are being fed messages that are deficient of biblical truth concerning the character and nature of God. All of the characteristics of God's nature must be taught. And often churches or often Christians only want to hear man-centered type messages. And, and those types of messages fail to expose God's people to the whole counsel of God's word about who God is. And so this is what I believe is deficient for a lot of us. This is why I believe if we're not careful, we can be deficient in this area. And it will cause us to think about sin in a different way that we should. The iron that many believers lack in their understanding of God is the reality of his justice, his judgment, and his wrath. I believe that many Christians are deficient in their understanding of the nature of God and his justice, his judgment, and his wrath. 
For fear of running people off, it is common for us to only want to talk about the love and compassion of our God who sent his son to die in our place. We often only want to share the good news of the good news. But the good news is not just good news in the good news. You cannot have the good news until you have the bad news first. God is a God of justice. He is a God of judgment. And he is a God of wrath. And so it's important that we understand that. It is much easier to ignore the reality of the judgment of God and only focus on one side of God's character and nature. I'll put it like this. Cultural Christianity is much easier to swallow than biblical Christianity. Cultural Christianity is only going to give you one side of the character and nature of God. Love and peace and joy and goodness and patience and all of the positive, what we would call positive attributes of God. And we will ignore all the ones that make us uncomfortable and squirm in our seats. That's cultural Christianity. That's a palatable Christianity. Who doesn't want to hear about a God like that? But biblical Christianity has an Old and a New Testament that reflects the character and nature of God. So I want to read something to you. Listen to the self-revelation of God. Exodus 34. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord a God merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sins. And amen, close your Bibles, let's go home. But who will by no means clear the guilty? Visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to a third and the fourth generation. Isaiah 13, the Lord says, I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will put an end to the pomp of the arrogant and lay low the pompous pride of the ruthless. Prophet Isaiah says again, Isaiah 59, according to their deeds, so he will repay wrath to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the coastlands, he will make recompense. That's just three verses. I got another one I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you four verses of the the judgment of God. I could have read a hundred or more verses and you would have been begging for mercy. Stop reading. But this is the end of the book. Revelation 21, seven and eight. The one who conquers will have this heritage and I will be his God and he will be my, my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, As for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. That's truth. We're deficient often in our understanding of the character and the nature of God. God is a God of love and forgiveness and compassion, but he is a God of justice and judgment and wrath and the reality of hell. The second death is is after we physically die. All those who have rejected Christ, all those who have rejected Christ, their place will be in the lake of fire. This is a biblical truth that Jesus talked about just as much as he talked about anything. So why do Christians and churches tolerate sin? And this is why I believe they tolerate sin. Why we, all, at, at any point in our life, we tolerate sin. It's because, it's because we don't see sin and rebellion the same as God does. We don't see it like he does. And this church at Thyatira, they had somehow got to that point Their consciences became seared and they got to the point that they were embracing what it says in the text are the deep things of Satan. They clearly did not see sin the way that God sees sin. So my next question to ask today is how does God see sin? or, 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 Or better asked this way, how serious does God take sin? Well, then there's another question you've got to ask to answer that question. How serious does God take sin? The next question would, would be this. What did God do to demonstrate how he sees sin? What, what, what did he do? He did what? You can talk to me. He sent his son. That's how serious God 
takes sin. He sent his only begotten son to do what? To die for my sin. So, so if we saw sin the same way God sees sin, I think we would live our lives a little bit different when we recognize that what he did, that the, the justice, the judgment, and the wrath of God came together and fell on the innocent son of God, the only begotten son of God. It fell on him. The justice, the judgment, and the wrath that we deserve fell on Christ. This is how serious God takes sin. Sin must be punished. The justice of God came together with his wrath against sin and fell on Christ. Which leads us to John 3, 17, which says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's how serious God took sin. He said, the only way that the world can be saved is if I send my only son to absorb the wrath and the guilt that they deserve, the punishment that they deserve. That's how serious God takes sin. So when we tolerate sin, it is because we are forgetting who God is. He's holy. He's just. He's wrathful. And because of that, he is love. You see how we flip the script? Listen, I I want you to track with me. This is how we flip the script. We, We come with the love first, right? But do you see, do you see this? That because he is justice, because he is wrathful, because he is holy, because of that reality, he is love. It's because of those realities of the character and the nature of God that he is ultimately love. Not indirectly. But specifically, listen, because God is holy, just, and wrathful, we can come to know him as love. Specifically because he's holy, just, and wrathful. And that's the good news of the good news, that we don't have to receive his holy, just wrath. We can know his love because he poured out that wrath on his son. Amen? Amen? The world wants, this is what the world wants. The world wants love without judgment. They want love without judgment. Christ says you can't have love without judgment. Judgment comes and you have to understand that I took your judgment. I took your sin. I took the wrath that was due you because of your rebellion. The world says, no, we only want love. We only want a loving Christ, a compassionate Christ. And this is what the church at Thyatira had forgotten, that the blood of Christ that paid for their sins, they were now embracing sins that they used to embrace that Christ paid for. They had forgotten that they had his love because he had taken their punishment. And that's what happens when we just have a steady diet of one side of the character and the nature of God. This is why statements like this are lacking understanding. Some people may say this, I can sin because God is loving and forgiving. God is loving and forgiving because he judged his son. And so I can never sin. I don't ever want to sin because God judged his son for me. You guys tracking with me? This misses the entire point. I don't ever want to sin because of who God is and because of what he did to pay for my redemption. So why do Christians or churches tolerate sin? I believe it's because leaders fail to lead properly. They fail to teach God's word. They fail to teach the whole counsel of God's word. That's why Christians can ultimately tolerate sin. And here's the last one. I I know this is heavy. We're going to wrap up here in just a few moments. But here's another reason why I believe this kind of all leads into this, this culmination right here. It's because of a false view of grace that is taught and believed. And this is what it would be called in the early church. There was a false belief called antinomianism. And what antinomianism is really is simply defined against the law or anti law. Or it's better described as a teaching that tells people tells believers that the law of God doesn't matter. That if a person, a person can live however they want if their spirit is secure in Christ, right? My spirit's secure, what I do with my flesh doesn't matter. 
That's, that's this, this, so the, the law of God, is, it doesn't matter. God did away with the law. So, so let's, let's real quickly define what the law of God is. The law of God, there's four areas. I, I, I would call it this. It's, the first one is the law of God's self-revelation. This is what we see in Romans 1. Mankind is held accountable to that law, to what creation reveals about God. Then you have the moral law, which would be the Ten Commandments God gave Moses on Mount Sinai. Given to Moses to instruct Israel concerning who God is and what he requires. Then you'd have the ceremonial laws, right? These laws centered around the order of the sacrificial system and included laws concerning clean and unclean, dietary laws, feast days, festivals. Laws to signify Israel's separation from pagan nations. Then you'd have the civil laws. These would be a further explanation, application of the moral law into Jewish society. So these are the laws of God. And so, so, so here's what I'll tell you. All of God's law is good. The dietary laws the ceremonial laws, the moral laws, the civil laws, right? They're all good. All of God's laws are good. Why? Because all of God's law reflect God. They all reflect his character and his nature. So all the laws are good. But what is the purpose of the law? What about now? Galatians 3 tells us. But before faith came, faith in Christ, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. Any schoolmasters in here? Any teachers? The law was our schoolmaster. The law taught us and, and brought us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after faith is come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So what was happening was, was that in the early church, People were telling Christians, false teachers were coming in and say, the law, the law, you don't need the law anymore. You can live however you want to live. Now that you're in faith, now that you're in faith, you can live however you want to live. It doesn't matter. But the law is still good. But faith removes the requirement of the, those dietary laws, of those ceremonial laws, of those sacrificial laws. Now we have the law of love, the law of Christ in relationship with him. Do you guys track, track with me here? So this false view of grace teaches people that because we're no longer bound to the ceremonial laws or the dietary laws, the grace of God gives us freedom to live as we please. But you know who addressed that issue? Paul in Romans 6. Listen to this. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Christians, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? He says, by no means. How can we who have died to sin, how can we have been born again, still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried with him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, that we might walk in newness of life. No, we're not under the law. We're under grace but doesn't mean that we can live in sin however we want to live. It would be kind of like this. It would be like my children thinking something like this. I'm going to actively disobey my parents a lot. I'm not saying they do that. I'm going to disobey my parents a lot so that when my parents give me grace, it will make that grace look really amazing. And sometimes I think that's what happens. I give him grace, and I'm like, man, what you did, that, this grace is amazing because you deserve something different. My kids learned quickly what the word grace was. And sometimes they'd beg me, we want grace, give us grace, give us grace. <laughs> but this is this faulty view of grace. It'd be like my kids saying, I'm going to live however I want to live so that when my, kid, when my parents give me grace, it makes grace look really amazing. That's what Paul is saying. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound and look beautiful? He says, no. How can we who have become Christians live continually in sin? He says, God forbid. Grace doesn't give us a license to sin. Grace reminds us of who we are in Christ. And who we are in Christ motivates us to live lives that please the Lord. So why do Christians or churches tolerate sin? I believe it's because leaders or pastors fail in their responsibility. And they fail in their responsibility to teach the whole counsel of God's word. And because of that, a perverted view of grace can make its way into the lives of God's people. So in, con in, in conclusion, the church at Thyatira, the majority had gone off 
into the deep things of Satan. They were tolerating sin, embracing sin. But the truth is, is that there will always be a remnant. There will always be a remnant. Look back at the text, so full circle, back to the text. I haven't read this section yet. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers, who keeps my works until the end, to him I'll give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. He's saying right here, he says, those who overcome, those who are victorious, who are believers, and in, in the end times, in the kingdom, that we will rule with him. All this imagery, I don't know exactly what that'll look like, but I just know that we're going to rule and reign with Christ. And he says this, I will give them the morning star. Who's the morning star? Who's the bright and morning star? Jesus. I will give him Jesus. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I love how it says there, but to the rest of you. To the rest of you who have not embraced sin. To the rest of you in Thyatira. To the rest of you at Living Word who have who've rejected false teachers and teaching. To the rest of you who love Christ supremely and put no other gods before him. To the rest of you, I lay no other burden on you except to hold fast to what you have until I come. Hold fast. Hold fast. Don't give up. The pull of the world is strong, my brothers and sisters. The pull of the world is strong. And the enemy of our soul lies in waiting to trap us and to ensnare us. Do you remember we talked about Samson last week? Right? To entrap us and to ensnare us. And, and we can think that, that we have strength that we don't have when we rise up as at other times and we have no strength. The pull is strong. I love what the Lord says to Cain. You remember Cain? Cain had killed Abel, right? And notice what the Lord says in Genesis 4. The Lord says to them, Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, listen, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. What did God say about sin? He said, sin is crouching at the door. The pull of the world is strong, and when I see this picture, it's like sin is hiding behind the door, and you're on the other side of it. It's crouching behind the door, and it's waiting for you to come around the corner, and it's like that, I don't know, that animal is ready to jump on you, right? It's crouching at the door. It's waiting for you, and its desire, some translations say, is to conquer you. But notice what he says. You must rule over it. Sin is like a a tiger hiding behind the door waiting to pounce. Sin's like fire. It's like an, it's, it has one objective, to completely consume. When you set something on fire, unless you put it out, fire will continue to go. It knows no bounds. The same is true with sin. It wants to completely consume. Fire is never satisfied and sin is never satisfied. Romans 13 tells, tells us this. Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for, you, for, for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. My brothers and sisters, if you're here today, if you're here today and you've been, you've been tiptoeing into sin, it is Way past time, cast off the works of darkness. Put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness. Not in sexual immorality and sensuality. Not in quarreling and jealousy. But do what? But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and, I, and I love this. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desire. Some people often wonder, I don't know how I got into that sin. You made provision for it. That's how it happened. You left the opportunity open. That's how it happened. The call is make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Every single one of us are capable of all kinds of sin. And we must live like that is the truth. 
and make no provision for the flesh. So as we conclude this morning, here's what I would say. May we be Christians who make up a church that that holds fast to Christ. May we be Christians who do not provide opportunities for our flesh to control our lives. And may we be a church that that reflects the powerful work of the gospel in the demonstration of a life that pursues holiness and rejects evil. May that be who we are. And may we never be like the church at Thyatira. May we always remember the price that Christ paid for our sin. We can know the love of Christ because of God's judgment, his justice, and his wrath because that fell on the Son of God for us. Father, we thank you for this truth. And God, may we never be like the church at Thyatira. May this be a warning for us, as it is a warning for that church then. May it be sobering for us, for my life and for all of our lives. May we see sin for what it is, that it is like a fire that is all-consuming, that is never satisfied, that never says enough. God, may we make no provision for that fire to take root in our life and to consume us. And God, may we live in in alignment with who you have made us to be. We are redeemed. We are born again. We are forgiven. And may that be reflected in our life every single day. And for those here today that you've never received Christ as your Savior, you've never received the gift of salvation through faith in Christ. You've never had your sins forgiven. Today, you can have your sins forgiven. Christ can save you and redeem you. You just have to follow what Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, to believe in your heart that Jesus is God, that Christ raised him from the dead. Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, and you will be saved. And you can escape the wrath of God in the second death. Got to pray that these things would ring true in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you. I will see you next week.